It has been a little while since the conclusion of the Star Wars sequel trilogy, and one thing is for certain. Every single frame of these three movies is going to be under the microscope for a long time. While one might think that YouTube has produced more than enough to say on the subject, I think I have a few new things to say that might interest you. Now let's get going before I change my mind and call them a bunch of irredeemable shit. This one is obvious. While The Force Awakens looks much nicer on screen than A New Hope, the entire Enterprise begs one question. If you start off a journey with the exact same thing, how could anyone expect it to turn out any different? For that reason, I won't bore you with a full recap of these movies, but we should consider how this script makes everything worse by boxing itself in. Now don't get me wrong, quite a few of the Lucas era movies have one or two contrivances that keep the plot from stalling out. One only needs to think about how Anakin has to win his pod race or why Padme didn't freak out at Anakin's extermination to see that. The trouble with this technique is that its repeated deployment can make the characters look like fools. So why does The Force Awakens do it twice in the very first scene? Think about it. If Poe didn't take the shot and just followed BB-8, the First Order would have been left with absolutely nothing. He inexplicably had to have a case of the stupids to move the plot along, but what follows presents another problem. Why didn't Kylo Ren use his memory-stealing power immediately? Well, long story short, the movie would be over. It'd be one thing if the crazy ended here, but these writing choices pop up over, and over, and over again. To get an idea of the true extent of the problem, let's consider some other questions such as... What would have happened if the First Order guarded its prisoners in the same way that the Empire did? Why didn't Anakin, Obi-Wan, or Yoda try to talk Kylo out of his path? How was there no other plan for the Starkiller other than to push the Millennium Falcon through at light speed? Better yet, why didn't the Rebels just do that in Return of the Jedi? What if Captain Phasma just sat around while the Resistance closed in? And last but not least, why did the final duel completely diminish the threat of Kylo Ren? When the audience has to ask far too many questions, it doesn't just strain the narrative, it breaks it. The Last Jedi gave Ryan Johnson the unenviable task of attempting to draw a line out from The Force Awakens. While the movie does have some quotable lines that are courtesy of Yoda, the messiness in the screenplay rears its ugly head in a matter of seconds. Since this story takes place almost immediately after TFA, the presence of these starships undermines that film's finale in two key ways. The most obvious question is, where were they? The four ships could have easily gotten everyone out of there while the X-Wings did their thing, and the First Order would have no idea where they went. Better yet, what could the bombers have done? Sure, they are slow and seemingly made of paper, but one or two of them could have destroyed the oscillator without breaking a sweat. That could very well mean that Han Solo died for no particular reason. Of course, the real answer to these conundrums is that the ships didn't exist until Rian Johnson made them up. But that's why this series has previously utilized time skips of several years. As for the Dreadnought battle itself, there is one big issue that most people are missing, and it has nothing to do with the awkward joke about Hux's mom. No, the real problem with this sequence is that Leia's control over her force inexplicably falls apart. This is of course done so that the ensuing losses can be pinned on Poe, even though a competent commander would not allow the bombers to be launched in the first place. After all, this is supposed to be a mission to stall for time, so why would they do that if they know that the bombers are that slow? After the battle, the film splits into two separate storylines. One is better than the other, and it's probably not the one that you're thinking of. Let's cut to the chase and talk about Luke Skywalker. Although there may be some code in the fact that Leia is the only old main who didn't give up the fight, the reality is that Luke's arc is the only one that could really be drawn out from The Force Awakens. The end of that movie was really the last chance for Luke to have an active role in the whole story. After all, would he not have intervened once he felt the mass murder perpetrated by Starkiller Base? What about Han's death? No, 
His failure to show up in that film means that he has to be ashamed of something that he cannot face. And since we only know that Kylo destroyed his Jedi Academy, that must mean that he accidentally or purposefully triggered the snap. Like it or not, it is what it is, and the ending makes Luke look absolutely miraculous. Unfortunately, the same praise cannot be given to the other storyline in this movie. The chase relies on a ridiculous number of just go with its from the very start, such as how Poe gets demoted for saving the Resistance from utter annihilation. After all, if Poe had actually disengaged, that dreadnought would have been able to fire its screw you cannons and everyone would have died. The same goes for Admiral Gender Studies' transportation plan. It doesn't really matter if she told Poe what was going on because it relies on the stupidity of the opposition. If the First Order constantly ran its decloaking scan or just looked out a window, there'd be no one left for Luke or anyone else to save. I mean, they're utterly doomed anyway unless another movie comes along and replenishes their troop count. But no one would be crazy enough to do that, right? Poe has to listen, and he has to stop being such a hothead, even though the women entrusted him with command of their Starfighter Corps. As for Rose and Finn, the Canto Bite side quest might seem pointless and irritating, but it actually throws in a massive case of the stupids. The illegal parking on the beach is just the start. Once the pair enters the casino, Rose reveals that the wealthy have been secretly funding and arming both sides of the war, which is a complete disaster in itself because of one simple rule. The larger a conspiracy is, the harder it is to keep it all a secret. With that said, the ultimate brain fart comes when Finn tries to infiltrate the supremacy without a disguise. They all know that he's a traitor! But Finn just went with it anyway because he read a script somewhere. No biggie. And of course, we all know how it ends. Kylo kills Snoke, Rey inexplicably doesn't die, Admiral Puffin stuff ruins space combat forever, Poe creates a stupid plan so that he can learn how to retreat, and Luke saves the day at the last minute. Go figure, I guess. The backtracking in The Rise of Skywalker is not the fault of J.J. Abrams or the other writers. More often than not, it is because The Last Jedi left behind an indescribable mess. One that could not be fixed without destroying half of the story of that film. Consider the reemergence of Sheev. Sure, the movie repeats itself by describing his return over and over and over again, but who else is there? At this point, Rey beat Kylo Ren twice, Snoke and Phasma are dead, and General Hux has been turned into a vessel for slapstick comedy. Like it or not, the only one who could possibly pick up the slack is Sheev himself. And besides, the choice to turn the reborn Sith into a zombie god emperor is disgusting and awesome at the same time. It's also worth noting that Rise is the most original film in this trilogy. Its overarching structure borrows bits and pieces from Return of the Jedi, Dark Empire, and even Mysteries of the Sith, but it also features an original fetch quest. Don't worry, there are problems and weird choices that are just kind of there. When the Resistance learns about the plot, our heroes make a beeline for Pasana and start their search in the festival there. All of the sudden, Rey gets into another Force chat with Kylo Ren, and he snatches her new necklace off of her. This is one of the parts of TLJ that was actually usable, so let's just move on. The resulting speeder chase is rather creative. However, the problem lies in the fact that it ends with the first fake out of the movie. We're supposed to think that our heroes are in trouble because they're in space quicksand, but Rey should be able to float out of that. Well, I guess not. Our heroes all sink? Except that they don't. They'd have to be stupid to keep doing that, right? What, Rey actually killed Chewbacca? That's crazy! Oh wait, never mind. Wow, 3PO might sacrifice himself. This is such a powerful moment because we've been with him for so long. Fooled me, again. Finn and Poe are about to be executed? How are they gonna get out of that? Oh right, Hux is the joke, so he has to be the spy. It all seems rather predictable, doesn't it? And sure, Rey's grandparents and the dyad twists would actually be interesting if they didn't stack a retcon on top of a retcon on top of a retcon. 
These movies constantly pay lip service to the idea that anyone could be seduced into fascism. However, the staff at Lucasfilm apparently balked at the idea that a woman could actually volunteer to have a tyrant's child. If we just go with the movie, however, these revelations scare the crap out of Rey, which works quite wonderfully on screen. Rise is Daisy Ridley's best performance in this trilogy, but we should ask ourselves something important. What if Rey's personality development is actually backwards? It seems like a swap of this Rey with the Rey from TFA would have made for a more cohesive trilogy. And it also would have eliminated most of the Mary Sue complaints. Just saying. When our heroes make their way to not Endor, Rey decides to go it alone, encounters a dark side vision from a video game expansion, and her Wayfinder gets crushed by Kylo. She's pissed, so she fights him. However, Kylo actually gets the better of her, and really? Oh, what a mess. Rey heals Kylo, so Kylo decides that he's just not bad anymore. Naturally, Rey freaks out and goes back to the first Jedi Temple, until she gets a pep talk from Luke. It's nice to see Luke as his old self again, but what follows is a little ridiculous. Except for maybe the message, I suppose. The final fight is rather goofy because it relies on a design error that allows for a resistance win. To be fair, every super weapon in this series has a flaw like this, but it gets kind of ridiculous after a while. Then again, the overall theme that rising fascism has to be checked by an armed populace is interesting, to say the least. On the other hand, the final battle against Sheev is a giant missed opportunity. Palpy can't possess Rey because she died in an awkward play on Avengers Endgame? It seems like a very somber moment when Ben climbs out of the hole that he got thrown into. Call me crazy, but Ben has no easy way out of this. His quest for redemption is going to be long and difficult because he and he alone will have to rebuild the Jedi that he helped to destroy. And he brought Rey back at the cost of his own life. Anyway, we have to celebrate, bury some lightsabers, and have Rey declare herself a Skywalker, even though Luke spent no apparent time with her beyond his bit part. And that's it! While Star Wars has been recovering lately, I know that I've struggled with how I've felt about these movies for a long time. And after all of that reflection, I think I can close this out with a statement of absolute certainty. The Star Wars sequel trilogy is an idiot plot. Nothing can truly come after it either. The Force Awakens obliterated the prospect of a unified galaxy that can combat existential threats, and its two sequels made it so that the Jedi can never be reborn. Not completely, anyway. It didn't have to be this way, and it's best to move right along. But for all of the mistakes and issues that can be found in this trilogy, we should not neglect one of the better lessons that can be found in its heart. He did my word not, did you? Pass on what you have learned. Use these movies as fuel to create something new. I know I will. Thank you so much for watching. There's quite a bit more to say about this franchise. Be sure to subscribe for that and so much more. If you'd like to support the channel, there are links for that in the description. Keep your head up, and I'll see you next time.